Hello, scientists. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Science Division Live. Today, we have David Krauss, our senior curator of vertebrate paleontology at the, here at the museum. He will be discussing Mesozoic mammals between the toes of dinosaurs. Stay tuned. Mr. Krauss will answer all your questions at the end of this live stream. Mr. Krauss. Thank you, Eduardo. It's great to be here from Windy. Conifer, Colorado. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me to talk about my favorite group of fossil animals, mammals, and from my favorite time period, the Mesozoic. But um, I also want to um, do this as a slide presentation, so I'm going to begin sharing my screen, and hopefully that all works smoothly. So hopefully by now you are actually seeing um, my screen. Can that be confirmed? It looks good here. Okay. Good. Actually, sorry about that, a little technical glitch, but here we are. Mesozoic mammals between the toes of dinosaurs. So why is dinosaurs in the title at all? Well, it's because they lived in the Mesozoic as well. And Mesozoic period is really interesting. Dinosaurs are absolutely fascinating, right? They lived a long time. They lived over 150 million years. They gave rise to birds. They came in all sizes and shapes, some of them huge and scary. And they're all extinct, except for the birds that they gave rise to. So being that they're extinct, we can kind of fantasize about what they looked like and how they lived, uh, how they walked, how they ate, what they ate, and so on and so forth. Mesozoic mammals, by contrast, they were all kind of small and mousy and lived between the toes of dinosaurs or in the shadow of dinosaurs. And that's the current thinking. But I want to disabuse you of that notion because we've learned a lot in the last 15 to 20 years that gives us a different picture. But let's just get a bit of a framework. So here, for instance, is uh, the framework, the temporal framework, the time framework. We're talking about the Mesozoic era, going from the Triassic to the Jurassic to the Cretaceous periods. And that was about 186 million years long. And you can see the dinosaurs uh, uh, above that time scale in the Mesozoic, again, in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, fascinating, fascinating creatures. And that period of time, the Mesozoic, because dinosaurs were there and other reptiles, is the so called age of dinosaurs, or the so called age of reptiles. And then the Cenozoic, beginning at about 66 million years ago, is known as the age of mammals because that's when mammals diversified. So we have this kind of dichotomy, and that dichotomy is separated by a massive asteroid impact at about 66 million years ago that wiped out about 75% of, of, of life on Earth, including the dinosaurs, except for the birds, again, that persevered. But is this really a dichotomy? Let's look a little more closely. When did dinosaurs originate? They originated in the late Triassic, roughly 220 to 230 million years ago. A little known fact is that mammals originated at roughly the same time. So we don't really have an age of dinosaurs and an age of mammals because mammals actually existed for over two thirds of their history was during the Mesozoic as well. And so just to start on one part of disabusing you of the notion that all Mesozoic mammals were small, mousy creatures between the toes of dinosaurs. Let's look at size, size alone. There was a paleontologist in 1999 who compiled all of the body masses of mammals um, and those right at the end of the Cretaceous. And he found that they ranged from about 11 to 590 kilograms. So what does that mean? 590 is about the size of a rat or a squirrel. And 80 kilograms, what does that mean in terms that we can think about in common usage? Well, if you took about 14 American quarters 
and stack them up, they would equal 80 grams. So pretty small. Bill Clemens, who was a very famous paleontologist, um, uh, wrote in 2003 that it's common knowledge and common knowledge holds that Mesozoic mammals suffering under the tyranny of dinosaurs were very small creatures. And Zofia Kilinovska and some colleagues wrote in a major textbook on Mesozoic mammals in 2004 that the vast majority of early mammals were shrewd and mouse sized, a pattern that persisted through the entire 155 million year history of mammals in the Mesozoic. So that was knowledge at that time. And so we can kind of summarize that accepted wisdom to at least up to about 15 years ago that Mesozoic mammals were scarce, they were very small, they were terrestrial, they were insectivorous, meaning they ate insects, and they scurried around between the toes of dinosaurs. And Ferris Jenkins, a Harvard professor, a very famous Harvard professor, um, described a, a Mesozoic mammal in 1981, and he was quoted in the New York Times as saying that finding of fossils of early mammals in the world is so rare that all of them would fit in half a shoebox. And he was right. There weren't many, and most of them were teeth and little isolated um, pieces of jaw, and they would have hit, uh, fit into half a shoebox. And part of that was because in Laurasia, in other words, the Northern Hemisphere, where we know most of Mesozoic mammals from, there weren't that many localities. There were quite a few from the Western interior of North America, a couple in Europe, a couple in Asia, but not very much. That picture has changed a lot over the course of 40 years. And here's what we have now, the sizes of those dots being you know, relative diversity, uh, the, the number of, of species that are now known. And you can see that there's a lot more dots on the map. There's even one in Greenland. There's a lot more, and some of them are bigger in the Western interior of North America. There's even some on the East Coast of North America. There's more specimens known from Europe and certainly more from Asia. And you'll see that the biggest dots now are from China and China and, and Mongolia. And it's in China that we've really um, uh, blossomed our knowledge of Mesozoic mammals. And this is just a chart showing the number of Mesozoic mammalian species reported from China beginning back in 1935. And the paper that shows this chart was written in 2014. And since 2014, it's, in, uh, it, it's, it's continued to skyrocket. In other words, we know even more now since 2014, seven years ago, about the numbers of Mesozoic mammalian species. And not only is it a matter of, of, of numbers of species, it's about quality of specimens. And if you look, this is just a sampling, a small sampling of the specimens known from the Mesozoic of China, primarily from the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. And you can see that these specimens are just remarkably, remarkably complete. And some of them even preserve soft tissues like hair or outlines of, of, of webs on skin. And most of them are, uh, so that's the good news. The, the, the bad news is that many of them are two-dimensional, essentially two-dimensional. They've been squashed flat. Um, but there are a few like the one in the middle, Rapanamamas, or the one down on the bottom right, Ubitar, that are also three-dimensional. So these are absolutely tremendous, tremendous specimens that have really increased our knowledge of a Mesozoic mammalian evolution. And so going with this quote, um, I'm doing my own estimate of saying now, uh, relative to 40 years ago, all Mesozoic mammal fossils in the world would not fit in half a shoebox. And I've changed that to the bed of a half ton pickup truck uh, because we really know a lot more. And in 1981, when Jenkins uh, made his quote, there were about 125 Mesozoic mammalian genera. Now we have over 400 and it's increasing rapidly. So here's kind of a, a, a dense slide, but there's only a couple of things that I, that I uh, need you to take away from this. First of all, the time scale on the left. And you can see here again, 
Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And along the top here are the different kinds of groups of mammals that we now know existed during the Mesozoic. There are only three groups that, that, uh, that went past and are living today. And these include the, the, the monotremes, meaning the platypus and the echidnas from Australia and New Guinea. It includes the eutherians, which are the placental mammals, the group that we belong to. And then also the metatherians that include the marsupials, uh, in other words, the, the pouched mammals. But again, we're concentrating on the Mesozoic here. And the, the, the take home point here is, you can see all kinds of other groups of mammals that existed during the Mesozoic. This was the, 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 the period of experimentation in mammalian evolution. These are mammalian experiments. And uh, we are going to take kind of a quick tour through some of these and you will see that we now know a lot more about Mesozoic mammals, not just in terms of diversity, but in the types of, of uh, uh, ways that they interact with their paleo environment. So starting at the bottom of that sequence of that kind of family tree, uh, we can talk about Morganucodons. And these were the earliest uh, mammal-like uh, creatures. And they were indeed small, but it's thought that Megazostrodon uh, which is a representative of this, of this group, was actually a tree climber. So again, not necessarily on the ground. And then there's another old early group that was really experimenting uh, differently. These are called docodons. The one on the left named Haldanodon was much bigger than a shrew or a mouse. It was well over a pound. And it's thought, if you look at its uh, feet, that it was probably a digger. And then really strangely, um, uh, uh, was a recent discovery from China called Castorocata, and that is because it looked like a beaver. And because soft tissue was preserved around the tail, we know that it had a tail, a, a broad tail, like a beaver, and we also know that it had webbed skin between its toes. So this animal was clearly a swimmer, at least semi-aquatic. And then in Australia, uh, the earliest representatives are from the Cretaceous, and they include uh, a monotreme by the name of Steropodon. And this guy was not small. It wasn't the size, it was well over the size of a rat or a squirrel. It was actually about five pounds in weight. So we're kind of expanding our horizon here of size and also in terms of locomotor and dietary diversity. And then there's another group known as eutriconodons. Eutriconodons came in quite a number of sizes. This one, Jeholodens, is really quite small, but Gobiconodon, which is known from North America, was really quite large. And you can see the five centimeter scale here. But surprisingly, from, from Asia again, from China again, there's a recently described form called Volaticotherium. And again, this really was a surprise because there were skin flaps between the legs and between the hind legs and the tail indicating that it had a patagium or a skin flap. And that indicates that this animal was a glider. So not a small terrestrial mammal, it was in fact a glider. And then at top right was perhaps the biggest surprise. The name of this animal is called Rapinomamus, and it, it was, not only did it probably look a lot like a wolverine, it was the size of a wolverine. It was about 14 kilograms, which means over 30 pounds. So we are absolutely exploding the notion that Mesozoic mammals were all small, shrew and mouse-sized animals. Even more surprising um, is the fact that we have good evidence of what Rapenomamus ate. And here is a specimen of Rapenomamus up in the top, you can see its skull. And here you can see one specimen and there's a mass of tissue right here. I'm not sure that you can see my cursor and that is expanded here and even further expanded here. And when that mass of tissue was explored, it was found that it contained uh, stomach contents. And these stomach contents 
included the bones of a juvenile ceratopsian dinosaur. So here we have a Mesozoic mammal eating a Mesozoic dinosaur. It was probably the reverse most of the time. It was probably dinosaurs eating mammals, but this is one case in which a mammal ate a dinosaur. And then one of the more common groups um, uh, in the end of the Mesozoic, and especially in North America, was a group known as multituberculous because they had many cusps on their teeth. And they came in a whole range of um, sizes and shapes as well. Uh, Rugosodon was, a, was indeed a small kind of mouse-like animal, but then Nemec Batar lived in a desert and it had desert-like adaptations for walking around uh, in the desert. And then on the right-hand side, you can see Tilidus. Tilidus isn't actually from the Cretaceous, it's from the Paleocene, but there were many forms very similar to Tilidus that lived in the end of the Cretaceous. And you can see some of its adaptations. It had the capacity to reverse its hind feet so that it could climb down trees head first. And it even had a prehensile tail, something that can grab on uh, to limbs and branches. Another form, uh, a group is, are the Cladotherians, and these are at the very base of the, of the group that e ended up giving rise to placental mammals and marsupial mammals. The one on the top left isn't that unusual, except that you should note that it is depicted as a climbing mammal, not one that is restricted to the ground, to the terrestrial environment, and it was probably an insectivore. But the one on the bottom left and on the right is Frutifosser. Frutifosser is extremely specialized. If you look at its teeth, they're all kind of peg-like. They don't even have enamel on them. And in that sense, they're very similar to um, armadillo teeth. And um, we also know that armadillos ate um, uh, ants and termites. And if you look at the legs of uh, the feet of Frutifosser, you can see that they were very broad, probably for scratch digging. So here we have probably a termite or ant eating form that was probably a burrower. And then finally, we get to the base of the, the, the group of mammals that gave rise to eventually us um, humans and primates. Um, and, and these are the eutherians. And the earliest one, was indeed um, uh, small and probably insectivorous, but it was probably arboreal, probably lived in trees. And then of course, we know the whole diversity of placental mammals became uh, much greater, but during the Mesozoic, they weren't particularly diverse. And then finally, or close to finally, uh, metatherians. This in group uh, includes the, the pouched mammals or the marsupials. And in the Cretaceous, at least, there were small ones like Alphadon, but there were also large ones like Didelphodon. Didelphodon um, uh, was over two kilograms in size, so you know four and a half pounds. And if you uh, can see its dentition at all, it, it, it was it was built for really grinding up um, uh, animals, probably. And so it was thought to be a, a durophagus diet, in other words, a very durable diet, and it's been speculated that it actually ate mollusks. In other words, that it was molluscivorous, ate um, uh, snails and clams, for instance. And that's kind of uh, what we, uh, uh, those are groups that we knew before, but uh, now we know so much more about them and their diversity in terms of their, their taxonomy, but also in their locomotor habits and their dietary habits. But in the last um, uh, uh, few years, uh, uh, there's a couple of new groups of Mesozoic mammals. And one of them is the Euheramidans. These are also from China and uh, um, primarily from the early Cretaceous. And if you look at the habits that have been um, uh, inferred for them, uh, you can see that there's climbing forms in trees. Uh, some of them had a prehensile tail. You, like you can see you can see on the bottom left here, but again, independently in evolved gliding adaptation. So, so we have gliding again as an adaptation, and we're just beginning to learn about this whole new group of mammals. And then a second new group are from the southern hemisphere, the southern supercontinent 
of Gondwana, and that's why they're called Gondwana Therians. And they are known primarily from India, from South America, possibly one from Africa, but also from Madagascar, which is where I've done most of my work over the last um, uh, quarter century. And in fact, in Madagascar, we have um, outstanding material of this new group of mammals, this new uh, group called Gondwana Therians, and we have complete skulls and skeletons. And these are what they're reconstructed to look like. But again, we're kind of blowing out of the water this concept that Mesozoic mammals were all small because the one in front in the foreground was probably about um, uh, eight kilograms. So in other words, about 18 pounds. And the one in the back was about three kilograms. In other words, uh, roughly six or seven pounds. So let's go back to this accepted wisdom. Uh, now that you've seen this array of Mesozoic mammals, which are pretty hard to sum up in 15 or so minutes. But uh, again, the notion was that Mesozoic mammals were scarce, they're very small, they're terrestrial and insectivorous and living in the shadows of dinosaurs between their toes. So now the new view is as of 2021 that they're much more taxonomically diverse than previously known. They're not all small. Many, in fact, were quite large, up to 14 kilograms, in other words, over 30 pounds. They had a whole diverse of locomotor repertoires and lived in all kinds of different habitats. Yes, there were terrestrial forms, but there were fossorial ones, in other words, living in burrows and digging to get into those burrows. There were scansorial, in other words, climbing and arboreal forms or gliding forms, and there were even swimming and semi-aquatic forms. And finally, we've already seen that they, they ate almost anything. Um, there were insectivores, but there were also carnivores, even ones that ate dinosaurs. And they also ate fishes, aquatic invertebrates, whatever they could um, uh, uh, get their, uh, sink their teeth into. There were omnivores, which means a really uh, broad diet. There were herbivores eating plants, frugivores eating uh, fruit, and granivores eating seeds and nuts. So let's come back to the title. Um, hopefully I have uh, disabused you of the notion that not all Mesozoic, that, that all Mesozoic mammals were small. Not, that is not the case. Some of them became quite large, uh, not as big, big as a T-Rex to be sure, but still quite large. And so the, the final point I wanna make here is that uh, while we were discovering all of these Mesozoic mammals, particularly from China, and finding out that there were much bigger mammals than we knew about before, there were also being discoveries made around the world. And again, particularly in China, in those same beds, those same strata that produced um, Mesozoic mammals, we found early birds and found that some of them were actually, sorry, I didn't mean to say birds, I meant to say bird-like dinosaurs, because many of them had feathers, which are preserved in these fine-grained sediments. But what we find is that they became ever smaller and smaller. Uh, it used to be um, thought that Compsognathus was the smallest known dinosaur. Everything that you're seeing on the screen, and there are other taxa as well, uh, are actually smaller than the chicken-sized uh, Compsognathus. So if we return to this slide and uh, throw our um, uh, fossil birds uh, uh, into the mix and look at the smallest uh, 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 bird-like dinosaurs, I said birds again, I should have meant, uh, I should have said bird-like dinosaurs. The bird-like dinosaurs, some of them were indeed smaller than the largest known Mesozoic mammals. So I will leave it there. Thank you for your time and uh, open this up to questions. Uh, hopefully there are a few that I can, I can answer. We do have a few questions. We can start with uh, Brian Sullivan's question. Uh, why didn't the mammals die out at the same time with the dinosaurs? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, I mean, we can't go back in time to really know that. And there's such a mystery about that um, uh, in terms of which groups survived. I mean, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, um, uh, dinosaurs all went extinct, but their, their uh, descendants, birds, went through. But even with 
with birds, there was some selectivity. There's recent research done in part by my colleague here at the Denver Museum, Tyler Leeson, that shows that the birds that lived in the trees probably suffered more during the uh, asteroid impact than those on the ground. The hypothesis being that those on the ground had a better chance for survival. But the mammals that existed, especially in North America um, at the time, included placentals, marsupials, and multituberculates. And for whatever reason, they went through um, uh, the asteroid impact and were able to have enough representatives to diversify uh, greatly. And as we know, that diversification took place really, really rapidly in the Paleocene. So placental mammals in particular, and this is being documented um, uh, most significantly, in my opinion, in a project uh, run by, uh, again, the same fellow, uh, Tyler Leeson of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, with the, the, the massive Colorado Springs project. And there he is showing that there is a great diversification of placental mammals right after the extinction of dinosaurs, and that they increased in body size quite rapidly. And another, uh, another question that I had was, what made these findings, like the exponential growth of all these findings of the mammals? Why are we now just finding all of them so fast? Yeah, um, a, a lot of that has to do with luck, of course, um, uh, in terms of being at the right place at the right time. And the China discoveries in particular were primarily because there were um, uh, uh, farmers uh, in the area that started uh, collecting these. And that became known to the Chinese paleontologists. And then they really started working those beds aggressively. And that's, that results in our explosion of knowledge. But more than that, um, it requires um, uh, exploration. And there are many areas in the world that are under explored. And that, in fact, um, uh, was the primary reason I started working in Madagascar. Because Mad uh, when I went to Madagascar in 1993, uh, there were no Mesozoic mammals known at all from that uh, landmass, which is actually twice the size of Colorado. Um, so it, it, it meant uh, exploring in areas that hadn't been looked at sufficiently before. And now there's a lot of exploration that's been done in South America in particular. And so there's, uh, we know a lot about Mesozoic mammalian evolution in South America. We also know something about um, uh, Mesozoic mammalian evolution on the Indian subcontinent and also Australia. All of those are relatively recent discoveries, but we still have this huge continent, the second largest continent on Earth, Africa, uh, to explore. And so um, that will be left to the next generation after me. Your, your sound is muted. That's a very big place to explore. So that makes sense. <laughs> and I have a question that my friend Vince wanted to ask you is, it connects to what you were saying. Uh, prediction, on, prediction from dinosaurs to, towards mammals is very well recorded. Um, and you talked about how a mammal, you find the fossil of a mammal eating a dinosaur, correct? Correct. Is there any evidence of mammals eating other mammals? Um, in the Mesozoic, um... Right now, I'm not. I'm not thinking of uh, of of any. Um, I mean, in order to to have that, you need outstanding preservation. Oftentimes, um, uh, soft tissue present uh, preservation, so that you can uh, figure out where the where the abdomen was, where the where the gut was. But off the top of my head, in the Mesozoic, um, I don't know of any examples. There there probably is, but it, it's such an unusual. Uh, occurrence of preservation that is very, very rare to see that. That makes sense. Yeah. And then we have a question by Alex. How did you know that the mammal you, you reference has a prehensile tail instead of a regular tail? Yeah, so there are four or five characteristics. I, I, I wrote that paper uh, in 1983, so a little while ago. 
Um, but a lot of it has to do the, with the proportions of the tail, the proportions of the uh, individual vertebrae, and what the um, hemal arches look like, which means the, the spines that go down into the musculature of the tail below the tail. So there are a number of uh, characteristics uh, uh, that if you look at mammals that have pre prehensile tails today, like uh, uh, New World monkeys, you can use that as an analogy to figure out whether or not a fossil mammal tail was prehensile or not. Wow, I didn't know that. That's super cool. Thank you, Alex, for the question. And then let me make, make sure that I'm not missing anybody else's questions. I know we're a little bit over time. I guess I can ask you one last one. Uh, there's a stereotype of uh, mammals during that time period for being uh, egg thieves. Is that actual true or is it just a uh, myth? Yeah, that again, there's no, there's no fossil evidence for that. I mean, we always, um, in order to infer habits of fossils that don't have any modern representatives, we always have to look for analogies. And uh, to my knowledge, there's no evidence, direct evidence of uh, uh, mammals eating eggs. But again, I mean, probably to, to support that view of analogies, if we look at Frutifosser, that, that weird uh, animal that I showed you that had peg-like teeth without enamels, uh, enamel on them, we look for modern analogs. And the modern analog is armadillos, and they have ex almost exactly the same teeth. And since we know that armadillos ate ants and termites, we therefore infer that fruit of phosphor also did. All right, that makes sense, that makes sense. Oh, I think I got one, another question. I know we're, we're over time, but I'll do one more. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, do you think mammals in what is now China were somewhat protected by distance from the impact? Um, Probably not. Um, I mean, there's there, there, the, the going statistic is that all life on Earth, 75% of it was exterminated. And there's no reason to believe that, um, uh, I mean, yes, they were probably protected somewhat, but they weren't fully protected and therefore um, uh, had to succumb to the same sorts of conditions. And what is even closer, um, and there's a huge controversy about this, is the volcanic eruptions on the Indian subcontinent. And those occurred at roughly the same time. Some of those eruptions occurred slightly before and some slightly after the impact, but they also probably had a devastating impact on uh, mammals. And since uh, Asia is, is now proximate to the Indian subcontinent, they were probably also affected by that as well. Hmm. I think we got all the answers. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being in this live stream. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And we should, go, we should close it out so we can keep spending your day. Thank you guys for watching the live stream. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eduardo. My pleasure.